So, uh, my name is Zina Eshkol. Uh, I work for the International Labor Organization as a digital publishing officer. And I'm working mainly on um, digital narratives, mobile apps, and working digital publishing. Hi, I'm Ahmed. Thank you. Hi, Florence Kim working at IOM and in charge of the Anomine campaign. God, we're outnumbered here. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, two in the field. Oh, please. Hello, Stephanie. I'm an intern working under Florence uh, for the Iowa Migrant campaign. Hi, I'm Liz. I am also an intern. I'm working with Amy Rhodes in community engagement. Great, so there's a couple more coming in from yourself. Yes, uh, Chris Reardon, who is our head of content, and Gisela Lovax, who, are, who is our chief of social. No, no, we shouldn't really start before then. Because she said, people oh yes, three minutes away. Yeah. Hello guys, I'm live to see you work. It's, uh, uh, yes, I'm. Oh, go ahead, John. Sorry. No, I, okay, yeah, I can, uh, it's John and Andrea and Michael, all from uh, the UN Department of Public Information. Uh, uh, myself and Andrea are in the Secretariat building today. Michael's on a, a different line. I'm, I'm not sure if it's the same for Michael, and I know this is always the same with these calls, but it's it's really hard to hear. Um, just with the, I, I can, the I can, background noise. Just to jump in, I can hear you perfect, John. Well, my audio from Geneva is really poor also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, these things are always tricky. Yeah. Um, so we maybe, turned our video off anyhow. But if you need to I, see us, turn it on. Okay, maybe as we're speaking, we should all just make an effort uh, to speak up uh, if we're in the room and as clearly as yeah, possible. You, People online. You're very clear. Thank Olivia, you, John. You're very clear. <laughs> Okay. Um, I would say everybody should emulate Ahmed. No, no, no. No, carry no. emulate her. <laughs> but I, I noticed, uh, is it Florence? Yes. Your voice was very clear when you were speaking, so it looks like you're sitting underneath a microphone. Or, or it's the French accent. It's the French accent. <laughs> that has yeah. a touch of charm. Hello, these, these are my people. Ah. <laughs> Members of my team. Gisela, uh, who, who used to work at UNIS um, before being coached by UNHCR, and I'm glad she was, because now we're working together again. She's uh, our chief of social media, and Chris Reardon is our chief of content in uh, the communication uh, section. Hi. 
Great, so we're all here. <coughs> You've missed the round of introductions, but because you know me and you know various others, I'm sure Chris will you know, at least let's do them again. Okay, Lenny, it might be better if you listen to the talk. Anyway, so just thanks very much for everybody coming. Um, this is really kind of a great opportunity for us to have a workshop or a discussion <coughs> about the Together campaign. Um, the Together campaign, you know, we all know it's the kind of one unanimous outcome of the summit of the 19th of September last year on refugees and migrants. All member states, everybody's behind it, but it somehow <coughs> hasn't quite, you know, taken off. It hasn't quite done what it was supposed to do, as was hoped to do. Uh, we thought <coughs> that uh, one way to help it along is to try and um, sort of create a marketplace, if you like, for stories, so that they're less uh, uh, an agency stories and more stories in their own right that have the kind of imprint of the agency behind them that's kind of facilitating them or, or curating them, if you like. So that's where this uh, uh, workshop comes from. Uh, we have for a couple of years had a project called I'm a Migrant, which Florence is, uh, has been running. And, you know, it's been kind of a, a let's put it this way, no, no funds have gone into it, no big advocacy has gone into it. It's been run by one a couple of people. And it's kind of chuntered along as it is. Um, but we like the model. We like the idea of that it's, it's an unbranded campaign and it's about stories of people as opposed to what IOM did for them or didn't do for them or what we claim to have done for them. So I think this is kind of the model that we've all adopted, if I understand it correctly. It's pretty much the, the model across these agencies that we prefer to tell stories of people or have them tell their own stories and in that way convey the message. So. With that in mind, we thought it would be a good idea to see if we couldn't design something that would enable the stories to kind of appear in like in a kind of marketplace type idea. And that's what Olivia is going to talk you through in a few minutes. Um, we've had various kind of, if you look at the website for the Together campaign, I don't think it kind of sets the heart racing or would have you jumping out of bed and throwing off the duvet in the morning. Just by the very nature of it, the way we've kind of treated it as being let's just put our material that we've prepared for some other reason on it. It seems not to have really gripped us very well. So with that in mind, we thought it would be a, a good idea to try to create a workflow whereby <coughs> stories are collated, they are directed to whichever agency of the, of the, let's call them the core agencies, for example, who take on the responsibility of looking after those stories and validating them and throwing out any garbage and you know, approving anything that goes out, for example, if there's something touching on human rights, that somebody in human rights in OHCHR would have kind of the veto power, if you like, for that before that goes out, so that you've at least seen it, it's got your kind of approach on it and your core, you know, eyes, your eyes on it. Same for UNHCR, same for IOM, and, and right around. And then this should leave the possibility for lots of other agencies beyond the five, I think there were five that were mostly involved in the in the summit last year, IOM, UNHCR, World Food Programme, World Health Organization, were they there? UNICEF, for sure. That would that this can kind of extend out way beyond those, but perhaps without as much um, kind of editorial control. But that again depends on participation. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Olivia, who knows a lot more about the detail of this than I do. Thanks, um, So just a few minutes ago, I emailed everyone a link. Um, on the thread that was the invitation for this meeting. So you can either uh, check your emails to open it up on your phone. Um, it should also have been shared on Blue Jeans as well for the people who've called in, or you can just follow on the screen. So what we want to do is take you through the sort of user experience for the app. So building what Leonard said, um, it's a story collection tool. Uh, stories that are about migration, so people's own journeys, uh, stories they collect of other people's journeys. Uh, but another big part of the tool is its action collecting ability. So it's not just uh, stories, it's also actions. Uh, so you can record actions like activities where you're helping uh, integrate migrants when they first arrive, uh, like giving an English class code. I think when you say migrants, you mean migrants and refugees. I mean so migrants. Take it as a given. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Migrants and refugees. People on the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Even better. <laughs> um, so it's it's really a, a tool to help you collect stories and actions. 
And then in the collection of, of both of those things, it's supposed to inspire and help other people get involved too. So it's building a movement of people for migration in favor of migrants and refugees. Um, so I'm just going to show you the first uh, page that will come up. Louis, just before you go ahead, can I just you know, really underline, this is a workshop. It's for you guys to say, it works, it sucks, change it. I mean, don't be shy. Mm -hmm. We've done this kind of, you know, in, in, in the dark, so to speak, without having enough sufficient input from everybody, but it's very much to be changed, to be fixed, to be made better, according to your input. No, no, definitely, because we want to make this as user-friendly as possible, but we also wanted to achieve, <coughs> help achieve the goals of the Together campaign, which is bringing together our relative rele relevant campaigns <coughs> with refugees like Stand Up for Human Rights, uh, but also showing what is the unique uh, part that makes them together. So with this app will help us make our content more uniform, but also bring in that action part, the, the movement building part. Um, so if we were to go to the first screen, uh, you'd see something like this. Um, and then it would load to register. So every person <coughs> would have to register. So what you would do is you would find the app either on your Google Play Store, if you're on an Android, or on the App Store if you have an Apple phone. Um, and then you would download and it would ask you to register. So you'd put in your email, then you'd be emailed a code, but also we're going to link it with other uh, social media platforms like Facebook, uh, so that it makes it easier to log in or register. So I put in my email, uh, then I get sent a code, then I put in the code, I can get the code resent to me if for some reason I didn't receive it. Then I put in my code. And now it brings you to set up an account. So, so just to, so I can ask a dumb question, this is for somebody who's heard about the app somehow or other, a friend or whatever, and they're just this is their first experience with it. They don't know what it's about. Really. No. So basically, to get to this point, you would have to have downloaded the app on your phone to begin the registration process. So you would ha have heard about it through a friend, surely, or through promotion from one of our agencies on social media. Uh, a big, big part, and you'll see as we go through the different functionalities of the app, is the ability for it to have um, sort of grassroots engagement. Uh, we have two different types of spaces, if you will, on the app. Yeah. Sorry, but why do you want to to have that code? And uh, I mean, why are you asking so much information about people? Because I know that there are many people who don't like to give so much information. They would be probably interested in, you know, going into it and maybe do that later once they are really interested and they look at it. But here, you're asking for names and and uh, emails even before the person knows what they're going to uh, to get into, what experience they're going to have. That will probably put off a lot of people. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I mean, we can look at having a different model where you get to the content before you get. Uh, before you set up, set up a, an account. What we were doing was following the model of most other sort of social media type applications on, on phones, uh, where you need to register first to be able to access the content or to be able to use the functionalities of the app. Uh, but there is, there is definitely an argument that if you ask people too much, then they might, you know, it, maybe it's a barrier to the content. What we can do is looking at how many steps are in the process or what questions are asked uh, can be limited to what's necessary. So, uh, so this would be register and then you'd submit your content and then it brings you to the first page um, of that. There we go. Uh, so this is the main home page, if you will, of the Together space, which is the main home space of the app. So you'll see that on most of the pages, we have the Together logo. We have this icon, which if you click it, will bring you back to your own user profile. We have a filter icon, which if you click it, will bring you to uh, a way of uh, filtering the stories and sort of it's a search, so you can search stories. And every time you log in or access the app, you'll always see uh, <coughs> six uh, highlighted content. So you'll see three stories and three actions so the best of the best from the different uploaded content. So here you'll see that we have 
um, a story uh, about Melody, who's in the United Kingdom, and has been tagged under with refugees, with other keyword tags such as human rights and migration. Here we have um, an sorry. Here we have an action, um, which has been tagged under I'm a migrant with keyword tags of teaching and community. So if you look at both of these. Both of these, uh, the stories and the action, you'll see they, they're color coded in two different colors and they have two different icons to differentiate which is which. Uh, so we have books for the stories and we have, um, we have uh, sort of a flash bolt for the actions, which is replicated uh, in the bottom search as well. So you have six on the home page, and once you scroll to the bottom of the six, you have uh, another menu which shows you all stories, all actions, all groups, and all campaigns. So maybe we can talk a little bit about what each of those things are. So the stories uh, we already discussed, um, that is someone's sort of migration story. Either it's me sitting down with Carlo and interviewing him, uh, or I write my own personal story where I've come from and <coughs> what I've experienced along the way. So it's sort of like personal profiles, if you will. Um, actions are the activities that you do in favor of migration. So it's anything where you're working with migrants and refugees, where you're helping people integrate to their new communities. Um, maybe you're teaching English, maybe you've organized some type, type of sporting game that people can play together. So it's really about interaction between host communities and um, migrant and refugee populations. Um, the groups uh, and the campaigns. So these are two of the main functions of the apps and two of the best sort of partnership spaces. Um, a group we'll get into a little bit later, but, and then we'll, I think we'll talk, we'll talk about app, uh, sorry, campaigns in a bit as well, and we'll just focus on stories and actions for the moment. Uh, if you'll notice at the bottom, you have a navigation menu. So this will be appear on every page of the app or every space that you go to. You always have your home. So your home will bring you back to this page, which is the six sort of highlighted uh, actions and stories. Uh, you've got your uh, story, stories button, which would bring you to all of the stories. You've got your add content button, which we'll go, go through in a second. And we have your, um, your actions button. And then there's a, if you want to see more, and it shows you groups, campaigns, FAQs, <coughs> for how to use the app and collect stories as well as your profile. So, I'm a user, I've just <laughs> set up my account. Um, before I start adding any content, I'll probably take a look at my profile first. So this is what your profile would look like. So we have Jennifer Doe, uh, we have a profile picture, uh, her current country and her country of origin, they could be the same because you don't necessarily have to be a migrant or a refugee to use the app. You could just be someone who interacts uh, with a lot of migrants and refugees. <coughs> you have the number of miles that they are, kilometers that they are from home. And then we have the contribution <coughs> and contributor levels. So this varies on how much content you upload to the app. Um, the more stories and the more actions that you upload, the better your contribution level is. Um, so it's supposed to spur people on uh, in a slightly competitive way, but for a good reason, to use the app more than the other people that you're friends with using it. Um, then we also have badges. So this depends on the how, how much content that you've uploaded. If you've uploaded a lot, you might get like a contribu contributor badge. Uh, if your content has been used uh, a lot on social media, you might get a certain badge. If you've done a lot under one specific campaign, then you might get a, a badge for, from that campaign. So on the profile, you can also hide, hide the badges so they don't necessarily show up. Um, and then you have the bio. So each person can put in a bio. Uh, however long or short it is, is up to the person. And then on each profile, we'd have your uh, content that you've uploaded. So this, so Jennifer has uploaded a blog about her uh, violin lessons in the United States, where she's taught some uh, refugees who newly, newly arrived uh, violin. 
Uh, she's also done a profile on Nimrod uh, from Israel. And then you can load more posts as well. So that's the functionalities of, the of each user's profile. So now I've set up my profile. Um, I'd love to, to see if I've made any spelling mistakes in my bio, it's okay. Um, and now I want to start using the app, uh, but I don't really know how to use the app. So I go to the FAQs and it gives me some instructions. So how to write a story or how to add one, how to capture out an action, how to record a good video, because there's also video and audio recording that I'll show you in a second, how to choose a good title. You can put a lot more, lot more um, FAQs under this where we can restructure it as well based on feedback from people in the room. So I've read some helpful points and uh, tips and now I feel like I'm ready to start using the app. Um, I'm with Carlo. I think Carlo has a really interesting story to tell. So I want to record it in the Together app. <coughs> Just like uh, many other sort of social media apps like Instagram, it's got a record in function. So you just click the plus button, up, button at the bottom to add content. So now a new post. Do I want to do a story or an action? Uh, since it's a one-on-one -on -one interview where I'm asking him about his personal uh, migratory experience, I'm going to go with story. So new story. So where did your journey begin? Carlo, where did it begin? Yeah, where? In Portugal. Portugal, okay. So type that in. Or type it in on my phone. Um, how old are you? You don't have to say if you don't want to. How <laughs> old? Where? So I was just born. When you left, okay. And then we can write the story, then you write in the full length of the story, whatever it is, if it's the interview or your own personal journey. We have it limited to uh, 400 words, but we can we can maybe make that a bit longer or shorter depending on what people think. Um, then the next thing is add a video. So the great thing about the app is not just that you're right, you can write in a story. Um, it's also that you can record video, you can take a photo, um, and you can record audio. So what I could do is take the, take my phone and set it up with a little tripod while we're talking, and it will record him. Um, See? So it would be something like this, and you can record. Oops, start recording. Yeah, and then you can like crop in the image size you want. I can add audio or I can skip it. So I could take a video and then also just record a little audio clip. Oh. I can add a photo, so the same thing. For most people it might be easiest just to take a photo and then start recording. And now, what is your story about? So this is something that's uh, quite relevant to everyone in this room. Um, we wanted to make sure that the different UN campaigns that are part of Together are well represented within the app, but we're not sure that everyone will necessarily know the names of the campaigns. So what we're asking people to do is tag it under keywords. Uh, is it, do you want to tag it under human rights? Do you want to tag it under migration? Do you want to tag it under specifically refugees, you want to tag it under equality. So a person can choose a few key tags. I hope you're going to be adding refugees to that. No, 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 definitely, definitely. This is just uh, to show some, like the designer just put in some of the keywords that could be. And will please send us your suggestions of what other ones need to be added. Um, and then a title for the story. So you just choose Nice, I'll say Carlo's journey. And then you'll end up with something like this. So this would be the content. So this is the photo that I've taken of Carlo. Um, <laughs> it's also a title. Um, and so you have, the, depending on what it was tagged under, it comes up under a certain campaign. A quote is pulled from the story. And also you have a like button. So this is something that we think, yep. Who pulls the quote? So before anything can get published uh, on the app, uh, each agency should have, or each, each campaign should have a curator. 
So for us, with Ivan Margaret, that would be Florence, uh, and the stories would go to her dashboard. So at the back of the app, uh, it's linked to a website dashboard. So users can log in on their computer as well. They don't have to log in just on their app. So say if I'm writing a longer form story, I don't necessarily <coughs> want to just write it with my phone. I'll let log in on my computer and I can write it with my keyboard. Uh, similar for the curators, uh, they can log in on their computer and have the sort of back end dashboard and see what stories have been tagged under uh, the relevant keywords that make them show up in their campaign. So if this had been tagged under um, migrants, uh, then it would show up in um, Florence's dashboard saying, Florence, you've got a story waiting to be like uh, edited or curated. Um, and then she would go through it um, and make sure that it's okay to go up. Uh, and would select maybe one key phrase from it uh, to sort of be the headline part of the story. So each agency would have a curator? Yes. Free. Is there an overall curator for the site? So for the overall curation for the site would be DPI, uh, like it is now with the Together, with the Together campaign. So when so you, you said at the very beginning, you see three stories, mm -hmm. The best of the best, if you will. Who decides which are the best of the best? At the moment, what we were thinking would be that the Together campaign, which is Stefania and DPI, would sort of be running that part of the app uh, and how much what is contributed to the sort of Together website as well, which is the external sort of facing part. Um, but how the individual agencies uh, make sure that their best content is then moved from their space to the sort of home page is maybe something that we need to figure out the sort of workflow of that um, so that it's not just uh, DPI on their own that we're all sort of involved in what is showing up on the home page. There's another what? question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question about the tagging. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, if it's migration, <coughs> human rights, it's quite obvious who would be the owner of the tags. But when you have equality, for example, who does it go to? Which agency dashboard is, is it going to show up on? That is something that we need to maybe look at with the agencies who are, are confirmed as wanting to have their campaigns within the app. Right now, we have a, a designer who put this together for us, and she just sort of selected random words that she thought were relevant to the campaign. Um, so She's not here as well. She's in the UK, so there's a little bit of dissonance there. I think just if I may, I think one way that this would work as well way out is that if you know you have a committee or a board, if you like, an editorial board, you have a representative, and they're in email contact with each other and they're cross-checking and you know, sharing, <coughs> sharing details because you don't want to Hi, um, quick question. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, Michael, we can hear you. Hi, yeah, um, I was just wondering if uh, you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on the curator system. So basically each story that gets posted, like shared by the user, then has to be reviewed by the um, by each person and each agency. And only after that happens, it will get posted to, to the app or how, how does it work? Yeah, so, so it'd be um, depending on what the story is tagged under, then it would be sent to the sort of curator for the campaign. So again, I'll go back to the migrant example. If it's tagged under the keyword of migrant, it will be sent to Florence, who would be IOM's curator for our space on Together with the I'm a Migrant campaign. Um, and mm -hmm. then she would quickly review uh, the story and the content to make sure it was okay, uh, and then publish it. Mm -hmm. What kind of turnaround time is expected with that curation? I guess it would depend on the capacity of the curator, uh, but maybe Florence, you can... <laughs> well, it will depend. I mean, so far, it's just like if I'm, I, I receive a notification telling me that I received, like, a new um, submission was made, then I just connect and <coughs> check the story, and it takes, like, roughly 10 minutes if it was done properly. You don't edit them. 
I, I, bear, I, try, I, I try to avoid to, to add anything or if I really have a doubt and if I have the time then I just send an email to the person because I know that the story would be worth you know having um, have I mean, the, the, the longer version and then I send an email with additional questions but usually I try to, to do with what I have and it's, uh, it's enough. But if I can just jump in, one thing, sorry, Ruth, just quickly. One thing we have to be really careful of is trolling. Yeah. You yeah. know, we don't want Richard today or whoever are their friends Absolutely. coming in under the wire and wrecking it. So we have to be like hyper vigilant, which is, I think, the reason it should go back to the agency because you will have a, a sniff test par excellence for things which are wrong. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, you know, this could all collapse because of workflow or disinterest. We already have lots of stories amongst us that we can automatically put up because we know they've been checked and ready. We're talking about bringing stuff in from the outside world. The I'm a Migrant campaign, if I'm not mistaken, has about a thousand profiles on it. And I think about 900 are kind of crowdsourced. Now sometimes, like, we will not have any political <coughs> finger pointing because that's the nature of our organization. It won't necessarily be the nature of OECHR. Love. Yeah, I mean, but that's <laughs> so the beauty of this should be that we can continue to be who we are. You can be very much who you are without, you know, without all of that kind of conflict. And I think you know, one thing we off, we will do, and for instance, is you send it back to our chief of mission in a country saying, like, this is an interesting <coughs> profile, is this okay? Because for us, it can be, things can be sensitive as it can be favorable. So, what happens if you <coughs> are you going to be able to? Put more than one tag on it because then it would get a bit chaotic. You know, it's about refugees, but it's a refugee screen because of human rights abuses, which are linked to <coughs> discrimination and equality and so on. I would guess that, like, if there's a, if there's a closely working you know, board, uh, editorial board, that they're pinging it to each other and saying, This has 20% well, of you and 30% of me. Where, you know, we just yeah, really need so a system for that. Yeah, yeah so I'm right away to contribute so the tax. The way that it would, would happen is if it's tagged under more than one keyword relevant to different campaigns, is that it would show up in the dashboard of the, say it's three different campaigns, it will show up in the dashboard of three different curators. Uh, one person from, say, IOM could curate it, and then when I, from um, another agency, log on to my dashboard, I see, okay, this is under three different campaigns, IOM's already curated it, uh, maybe I don't even need to look at it, so I can just click. Uh, like publish from my side, or I can look at it as well and then click publish, and then same for the third person. So at the moment, that's the way that we were thinking of running the dashboard for the sort of overlapping uh, campaigns. But then you could you publish twice? So then it would show, it's not that it's been published more than once, but it's showing up in more than one space uh, within the app. So we haven't got to those spaces yet, um, and I can show you. Um, just, yeah, go ahead. In terms of the user experience, how um, I mean, how how do we tell the users that this publication process is not immediate? How do they know that there's going to be a creation and then? So once you uh, submit your story, then you would get a screen that says uh, your story has been submitted and will be will be posted in the coming days. So you get a sort of and then you get a notification on the app once your story is up, so that you can go and look at sort of the fruit of your labor. And will the creators be um, able to edit the text? I mean, if there's spelling mistakes and is that part of the... Yes, the curators can edit the text. Just on that front, um, what about uh, reflecting the linguistic diversity of the UN? Is this only going to be in English or is it going to be possible to have posts mm -hmm. in the other official languages? So, um, at the moment, the beta development of the app is in English. But the hope would be that it would at least be Spanish and French. And then beyond that, obviously, since it's a UN campaign, it needs to eventually go to six, six different languages. <coughs> what it would really depend on is the ability of the curation of the, the languages of the curators from the agencies. Um, and what, langu lo what languages do we have the ability to curate in? Um, <coughs> is what it would really. So we can, we can develop the app in multiple languages. Um, and the screens can have the different languages on them. But if people are submitting in Arabic and you don't have anyone to curate in Arabic, it would, it would be a difficulty. So I think it, it depends on the capacity within each agency as well. Um, uh, one more question here, if I may. Sure. 
We have one question in the room and then we'll come to you, Michael. Sure, yeah. Um, back on the community standards, um, do you have a clear explanation of use? Um, I love the idea of using more user-generated content, it's something we're always trying to do, but it's so tricky with refugees and, for example, any UNHCR story, the refugee featured in that will have had it explained to them a minimum of three times exactly what, where, what platforms, how potentially viral this can go. And so that's going to be part of the curation process. For example, somebody may give away personal details that could endanger them, but they're not even aware of them. So not only that, also do you have an explanation of who owns the content, where it could end up, um, and also just behaviours. So for example, I presume you, we're not going to show under 18, so we are children, um, illegal behaviour, uh, people filming where they should not, uh, and, and so and, and just or verifying the veracity of, of statements people might make. It's a huge time investment. So I just wondered, in terms of your community guidelines, I guess people will hit, read those before they get to the point of creating this content. Yeah, so within the FAQ part is where we have that different sort of the definitions and what how you should, uh, the things you need to do before you can record someone's story, what age they would have to be to be able to take part in the Do have product. to be over 18? Adults. We hadn't said that, but for I'm a migrant. For a migrant, we, we have a content form to design or at least tick the box to make sure that the person who's actually sharing the story has received the consent of the person. <coughs> we also make sure that even though the consent, <coughs> we know that it's not threatening the life of the person because sometimes people accept and, and give their consent without knowing that yeah. it, it can be. Uh, extremely um, dangerous for them. So this way, I, at least I make sure that this doesn't happen. So but how do we know? I mean, uh, I, I think Isela's point is very important because we don't know, and they might not know. The person who's filming might think that, okay, they did the whole thing right, and then, you know, like in the background, there are people who are going to be recognized or the person gave the consent that shouldn't have. And so we actually expose them rather than protect them. So how do we make sure we don't do that? Sure. Um, I think there's, so before anyone would upload content, <coughs> first click on this button. We'd make sure that would bring you first, have you read um, the FAQs? Have you read the community standard, like that type of thing? Then once people are uploading content, we'd have them tick boxes to say, have you gotten the content from the person the story is about? Is, so there'd be specific questions as you upload that you have to tick the boxes of. Then when it comes to our end of the agencies, when it comes to our curation, we'd have to make sure that if it's something that's a sensitive topic, that it is fulfilling uh, all the boxes that it needs to, to be able to be made content, uh, be able to be made public. Um, so that's, the, that's the way that we were thinking about dealing with that. But if people have other ideas or other concerns, obviously we'd love to hear them. I wonder, just on the issue of asking if somebody's uh, had consent, I mean, if it's one user profiling another, mm. for example, um, is there a way that the, the person being profiled could also be asked to tick um, so that they, they, you know, it's basically you've got, um, you know, I say I've received your consent to do a profile of you or do a story about you, but then you would receive a message having to confirm that as well, a kind of double level of confirmation. Is that, is that an option? I mean that is definitely an option. Uh, it would just we just have to make it that everyone has an account. The only problem with that would yeah. be that if you're profiling people who don't have smartphones, yes. which can happen in like a lot of places in the world, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to go to that double layer. But we could make it so that if someone does have an account um, and you put their name in, that then they get a notification. Well, I was just going to say we don't have to rush to publish and. All of the agencies have protection officers and have people who can look working locally who can follow up. The storycore.org platform, which it's somewhat based on, is a story collecting or an oral history platform in the US, which has about 50,000 oral histories that have been recorded over the last 10 years. You will not get access to those 50,000 stories. Most of them are in an archive or in the you know, <coughs> Library of Congress. They publish a small, relatively small number of them. So I think it's a really good point, especially if it became popular. It's a super important point, and we need to be above all hyper vigilant to it. We've seen what was on Facebook just last night about the, the, the murder. We don't want any of that nonsense near this thing. So I think you know we can take the foot way off the gas pedal, put things on that we know that we've already collected ourselves, 
And then you can have a system of trusted users, like community correspondents, mm -hmm. whom you know over time and practice produce reliable stuff like the stringers. But I think there does not have to be a rush to get the world to submit stuff and then risk having it destroyed with one bad story. I think, Michael, you had something online? Yeah, hi. I was going to ask about um, sharing possibilities, but I was poking around the app just now and I saw you have various um, share buttons to Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and Google+. Plus. So um, that was originally my question, but I see they're there. So I'm going to adjust my question and ask uh, maybe do you envis envision that co um, the content from the app somehow being linked to the existing Together website? or because I, I know that's something John was going to ask also, but I don't know if they are. I think they might have disconnected because they, they were having um, connection problems. So, yeah. Sorry. So the, the idea at the moment is that this the stories that are collected through the app are, is what is what is used to populate the Together website. So at the moment, if you go to the Together website, uh, you'll see the home page, but there's also a page I think called Stories. So on the home page, you'd hopefully have a highlight like you would on the home of the app of the, some of the best content. Um, and then on the stories uh, part of the Together website, you'd be able to access all of the stories and actions from the app. And, and technically speaking, that would be done by, um, so we, we could arrange that um, with your developers or mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's something doable, right? Yeah, so we were talking to John about this last week, Michael, that the, oh, okay. the back part of the app is uh, Drupal, <coughs> and the, t the Together website is also Drupal, so the integration yeah. should be okay. Okay, thank you. No problem. So uh, Michael actually brought us to a good point. Um, so each story and action is ready to be shared um, on other social media platforms. So here we just have a few examples. You can. You can post it on your Facebook, you can tweet it, you can share it on your LinkedIn, on your Google+. <coughs> this is to encourage more people to download the app, to read the stories, to become part of the movement. Uh, another thing, which is an in-app function, which is the like button. Um, if, you if you like the story, then like it. Um, the more likes you get, the more validated people feel about their content, uh, the more content that they're going to post. So this is sort of the layout of uh, a story once you've posted it and once it's been approved. And then also we had the idea of linking it to the sustainable development goals. Um, so the story is relevant to 10 and 5. So that is posting um, a story. All stories then are shown under the story um, space, which is here. Well, they, they all show up just like this under the story function. Um, so also we have the option of adding an action. It's the exact same sort of process as adding a story. You have the same functionality. You can record video and audio. You can take a photo. You can add text, um, except it's more of a blog piece, more of a story about something that's happening as opposed to a personal profile. And then that, all the actions show up underneath uh, on the action space, which is here. Um, so all the stories and all of the actions are tagged under certain keywords. So then they get curated by different agencies within their own campaigns. Um, they show up on the story space. They show up on the action space, whether they're, if they're a story or an action. But then they also are under each campaign. So at the moment, we just have a selection of a few different campaigns. And as you can see, on every page that you go to, the bottom navigation is always there. You always have the, to be able to navigate back to your profile as well. And you also have a back navigation too. So for example, we have a, a few of the campaigns from some of the people in the room, and we can add more as well, depending on whether you have the capacity to have someone curate some content. So this is a campaign page. 
we have the name of the campaign, we have the amount of contributions that have been uploaded to the campaign. Uh, we can share the campaign on Facebook, or sorry, go to the campaign page on Facebook, but I'm so sure. Uh, you can go to with Refugees page on Facebook, different social media. We have a brief explanation, which is actually, you would just see sort of two lines of it, and there'd be a plus to read more and minus to read less. And then you get to the campaign, or then you get to the content. So you have the different stories and actions that have been uploaded by users and then curated by the agency, and they show up under the campaign space. So that's the campaigns. Um, and we're really open to any feedback on these spaces as well. If there's anything that we're missing, if there's more things that we should have. Um, another functionality of the app as well are the groups. So we have the campaigns, which is like, I am a migrant uh, with refugees, signed up for human rights. But then we also have a group function. So this doesn't need any curation, but it's a way to tap into different networks around the world. So, for example, I've set up my account, um, I have uploaded some content, I tagged it under um, I tagged it under human rights, and now it's been curated and it's up in the Stand Up for Human Rights section uh, of the app. But I'm also a member of um, Amnesty, and I'd love to somehow show my connection to Amnesty with the content that I'm uploading to. Um, so there's an ability for together to partner with various sort of networks, whether they're grassroots or um, global, uh, like UNV, around the world. Um, and they can have a space on the app. So let's see what the card has on the slide. So they can have a space where you see how many uh, contributions have been uploaded from their members. They have a certain amount of members, what their level is. So similar to the profiles, there's a bit of competition between the groups as well, because it's groups of profiles. They have badges. This can also be hidden as well, so it doesn't take up so much space. Uh, a little bit of info about Caritas, maybe just two lines, and then you can plus or minus it, see more or less. And then you get to all the content. So all the, the members of this group, any content that they've uploaded can show up uh, within this group space. So as a user, um, I would as a user, I would go to the group uh, space and I'd look for Amnesty or for Caritas, search it, and then join it. Um, and then whatever content I upload also shows up in these spaces as well. So the reason the reason why we decided to add a group space as well as the campaign spaces is because with the camp campaign spaces, uh, they need to be curated. Whereas we know that we want to partner with uh, various networks um, throughout the world, uh, but they might not have the capacity to curate content. Uh, so the groups are just more like groups of profiles as opposed to content from any campaign. So um, I think we've taken you through most of the spaces on the app, and I've also sent out the link as well, so that you can go through it on your phone. Um, does anyone have any more questions? Yeah. Um, I wonder why uh, app, this is a native app, right? So we will have to download it uh, if somebody wants to access it. Why did you choose to go for a native app rather than a web-based app? <coughs> um, we thought that it'd be easier if someone had it on their phone, and we're sort of trying to replicate models that have previously worked um, with other very user-friendly apps. Um, if there's an argument to made for it to be web-based, we definitely would consider it. Well, at, at the ILO, we, we, we went through this experience of producing something native first. Um, so we did this with the InfoStories app. We started with a, an app for iPad. Um, and after a while, we realized it was a big mistake that uh, people actually wanted. So if you share it on social media, people want to click on it and access the content immediately. They don't want to go uh, to an app store that will take them 
um, so more you can time, more space yeah. available. Um, so we realized that once we created the website and we we, we adapted all the content from the, the, the iPad app on the website, we had a lot of we have a lot of traffic now, something that would never happen with a with a, an eighty five. Mm -hmm. So so it would be so all the content would be mirrored on the website as well. So if I'm on my desktop and someone I'm on my Facebook on my desktop and someone has shared a story um, and I click on it, it will bring me to the website. Yeah. But if I'm on my phone, it would be go to mobile site or download app. <clears throat> so you'd have the option. You could just yeah. go to the site or you can download the app. And, and, as I see it, unless there's like a really good reason to have an ATV app that will uh, allow you to access functionalities on your phone that would not be possible through a web-based uh, app, there's no real good reason to create a, a native app mm -hmm. because you'll you'll just creating one more barrier for the users. You're asking them to download something. Sometimes they won't have enough space on the phone, then they'll just forget about it. They won't. Once they they test the app, then they'll they'll, they'll delete it because. Uh, they don't need more space for the mm -hmm. Facebook Messenger, for all the other apps that take a lot of space. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for according to our experience, um, I, I don't know, I mean, it, it really depends on the target audience and uh, um, what kind of functionalities you're giving with the app, but it, it, it seems to me that everything you're offering here could also be offered on a, on a browser. Mm -hmm. I guess I, the... I suppose it's, yeah. I mean, I suppose it's, it's whether you can do things offline then it becomes quite convenient to have, I mean, to write the story yeah. and all this because then it doesn't use uh, bandwidth, right? Otherwise, it's just a mobile site. It's not It's not a downloaded app as such, right? So, yeah, so there's, I guess there's two reasons why we thought maybe an app would be good. Um, the functionality of recording, taking the photo, uh, recording video and audio. Uh, is easier in an app than in a sort of web-based, and then also the offline function as well, uh, which we didn't put into the the presentation, the design presentation yet. Um, but for us, a lot of our colleagues are based in places where the internet is really bad, um, and they'll be using the app to to gather stories. So we have been talking about having an offline function as well, where they can record, um, they can like to basically do the functionalities of putting together a story, and just not publish it until they have like Wi-Fi or, or data. Maybe, maybe providing both platforms uh, would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like there's a, a relation between um, low uh, internet connection and uh, low end mobile phones. Mm -hmm. So someone who doesn't have internet connection will, is more likely to have a phone with less memory as well. So even if you can provide access, offline access, then this person won't be able to download the app because it person won't have enough memory on the phone. So I, I sometimes I don't feel like giving offline access is, is a, a strong reason to create a, move, a mobile app. Okay. Um, Maybe you first, because it's your yeah. uh, I, I have a question um, about the gaming component or the small competition between users. I was wondering, can a user see other users' profiles? and? Do they have the the, um, the possibility to interact between each other? I didn't I didn't see that, and I thought maybe it would be something that would add a little more um, interest into into this game. Yeah, no, definitely. So at the moment, you can view other users' profiles. Um, so when you're on their story, you can see the person who's contributed it, and then you just click on their name, and then you you're brought to their profile. Um, and then the other means of interaction is when you're reading someone's story, you can like it. At the moment, that's as far as the interaction between the two. And also, you can join the same groups as someone else. So you can see what the other people in your groups are uploading. Um, but beyond that, that's the only interaction we have at the moment. But we definitely would be love if you have ideas for more. Um, <coughs> do you think that like getting people to use it once and then come back again? is about how much interaction you can have with the other people who are starting to use it as well. Hi, Olivia. It's John and uh, Andrea with a question, if you if you can hear us okay. Yeah, we can hear you. We have one question in the room, and then we'll come to you. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, I had a kind of related and multi-part question. One, I mean, there's sort of a long sequence of asks here. Um, and why, would, why will people want to do that? 
and share something in this community rather than in the communities where they already are. On Facebook, for example, they have the app already. They know how to use it. Um, will they be patient enough to go through all the steps to, to be able to post here, and what do they get from it? And then with the gamification, um, yeah, is there a leaderboard where they can see where people rank? And what does the winner get? You know, do they come to the Global Compact in New York in two years? Or? Badges. Badges. That's what she explained. That. No, nothing, nothing tangible for the, but maybe the we top should winners. Or yeah. <laughs> nothing real world. Maybe we should have something more tangible. We don't, at the moment, we don't have a leaderboard, but we could definitely add something like that, uh, which makes sense since we're having, since we have their sort of point level on their profile. Um, the, and yeah, so for us, the reason why we would hope someone would use this, uh, as opposed to just sharing a profile on Facebook or any other social media, is that they're part of a movement that's very specific to sort of migrants and refugees. Um, so in our promotion of the app and the use of it, we sort of use that as a selling point. Um, also, I feel that people don't ask, well, maybe some people do, but most people don't like to sort of share too much content about one specific thing always on their social media because uh, they, they know their friends have various interests. Whereas on this, if I'm someone who's really active working with the newly arrived refugees in my community and I really want to continue to share stories, I'm going to do it on the app as opposed to every time on my Facebook because you know that your friends can get a bit annoyed if you're constantly posting about the same thing. So it gives those people a channel uh, and then it gets, brings other people into this a sense of a movement. Are there KPIs for that? I mean, a sense of what would be a good number of contributors or average number of contributions per <coughs> contributor? Not yet. Not yet, but that is something that we need to do. <coughs> no, France, I just wanted to add something about that because, I mean, why would we actually do a together campaign? Why would we actually try to develop a, a, an app? I think the whole idea is, as, uh, it's a bit what you say before, it's like to actually show that, no, it's not only about xenophobia and violence and racism raising but in Europe, but actually <coughs> there is something existing. People are actually already doing something. It's just to actually try to map this, to show that there is something that we want to acknowledge, that we want to show. No, it's not only about xenophobia rising. So I think this is also one major aspect of the, this app. Also regarding the tangible you know, output for a, a contributor, uh, we have on I'm a Migrant uh, the possibility of becoming an I'm, I'm a Migrant voice like a sort of a goodwill ambassador, a light version of that, of that. And actually people like to talk on behalf of something that we I mean, uh, uh, for I'm a migrant, they like to know that we have said that, yes, you can talk on behalf of I'm a migrant. You can tweet on behalf of I'm a migrant. And this would actually be a potential output if you, if you like the idea. Yeah, because what, what you can see with this app is it can be a great avenue for agencies to real people on the ground, whether they're migrants, refugees, or just supporters of both. Um, in the similar vein of what we've done with I'm a Migrant, we've produced podcasts from that. We invite people from I'm a Migrant to our events so that we have more migrant voices. You can look at the different stories that people have um, uploaded and then develop it into something else. Like with where Wyden and Kennedy um, are partnering to help the campaign, so they can look at the stories that are collected and develop them into more things. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, no. When you finish. <laughs> And just and for us as well, like it's not just an uploaded story is not the end of the story. Mm. Um, more things can be done with that with the consent mm. of the uploader. Mm. Sorry, John, yeah, yeah, John. Sorry. Was that over to us? Hey, hey there. Um, yeah, we just had a. I'm sorry we missed a chunk of the presentation. We're on a, onto our second device trying to log in, but. Uh, we had a just covering like uh, a few different issues um, and some of this stuff, Olivia, you and I talked about already. Um, but um, I think, you know, I think the questions about trying to motivate people to download the app and engage with it are, are fair. And, and we were trying to think about ideas here about, you know, why this as a, opposed to any of the other, the other platforms. And 
the gamification is is definitely interesting and you look at how things like you know global citizen use that to get people to actual events and to engage with things that they they really really want so there might be some offer that we need to come up with and we know that like people like the idea of being kind of ambassador voices on issues so elevating people's profiles to speak on an issue it could be also quite useful for um and um we're also kind of a so we're thinking around you know ideas of why people would would download the app and engage with it in the first case in the first basis um uh, we um uh we have like a i guess a, a bigger kind of positioning question which is around the use of together because clearly together is can be used as an umbrella um but the question for the campaign is whether it's more than just an umbrella because the stories um, that we were focusing on and the, the content, I mean, and understandably right now, the website is, is paper thin, as, as Leonard quite rightly said, um, and there's not a lot of substance to it, but everything that's in the works is to do with this connection between uh, the local community, the host community, and the refugee and migrants that come to it. And that was the kind of together moment, the join together moment. So together has its own idea about what its specific content is and what um, it has its own hashtag. So in some ways, it's it could be in the list of campaigns that are on offer because there could be a, you know a joined together campaign. The hashtag could be there. But in this particular app, it's being used as the umbrella. But I wondered to the user how confusing it is to have something called together that doesn't really come up again. It's not really explained what, exactly what together is. Um, and it, it, it's, it's an umbrella as it appears to a bunch of sub campaigns, but I, I think we need to work a little bit more on uh, exactly whether if this is truly the together app and it's branded as such, then we need to be sure that it like aligns with all the different things that together is trying to do, or is it just like a, you know, superficial hat that goes on top of a, a you know, all the different sub campaigns that agencies are trying to achieve. Um, and on, on that note, the the specific feed of stories that we were hoping would go to the together website we, we were trying to work on these joined together moments the kind of refugee and migrants with the the community engagement the stuff that was in the the sg's report so we we're hoping to focus on those so i don't know if there can be a tag for together content as opposed to a, a kind of taking the whole feed from every single type of bit of content that's produced um that might be something we can just figure out as we see what stories you get uploaded. Um, uh, and pleased to hear about the, the multilingualism that's being thought about, because obviously that's always an issue for us. Um, and then just the kind of support and scalability, like it sounds like you've got great partners. And to be honest, it, it looks so good. Like the app is visually really appealing, which is so much good work's gone into it. So we were, uh, um, you know, there could be many more elements to this. Um, and right now it, it makes sense to focus on the storytelling, the key element, but there, there could be much, much more that we want to add to a kind of together app over time. And just looking at that kind of long-term relationship with the, with the app. Um, so there are, are kind of thoughts um, across the different areas, if that helps. Andrew, is there, sorry, I didn't want to you. Okay, yeah, th so if that's helpful, uh, over to you guys. Yeah, no, that's really helpful, thanks, John. Um, so the way that we've been trying to develop it um, is not just that it's user friendly, but it's also scalable as well. So if you look at the bottom menu, we have sort of the four main functions, uh, or well, the one main function, which is add a story, and other four, three key pages. Uh, but the rest of the menu is here. So we can definitely add more functions here and play around with this. Uh, the organization or company that we're working with who's developing it is developing it, it specifically for us. So we'll own what they make uh, and we can continue to develop it over time. Um, John, thank you for raising the sort of action part of the Together campaign. So right now you can see that we do have it divided into stories and actions, uh, but we do have the actions broken down to each campaign under the Together umbrella. Um, but it is something that we could consider bringing the actions up to being uh, umbrellas themselves and having just the personal profiles being tagged under each campaign. Something that we could discuss depending on people's feedback. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry to come back to the uh, privacy issue, but 
But I think, you know, particularly nowadays, it's really a very important one. Um, our colleague over there with glasses, but I forgot his name, was asking Chris. Chris, how could I? How could you do that? <laughs> Chris Reardon. Uh, was saying, for example, why wouldn't we, why wouldn't people put, put uh, content on their Facebook uh, account, for example? Well, on their Facebook account, they are amongst friends that they chose to be amongst, that they know, and that they know personally, or they chose, you know. And, and their privacy, their profile, or whatever, doesn't go beyond that if they don't choose to. Here, there doesn't seem to be that that level of privacy protection. I mean, if you go back to the um, to the profile, mm -hmm. I mean, frankly, even myself, I wouldn't put all this information out, and certainly not if we're talking about potentially vulnerable people mm -hmm. who are not home for a reason that is not necessarily a very pleasant one, and they don't necessarily want to advertise what happened. And I mean, telling their story is one thing. But giving all the information <coughs> where they are, where they are, where they came from, that might be a little bit more problematic. No, and it's definitely a really good point. I think what we've envisioned is that you don't necessarily have to fill out um, all the questions asked, and we can maybe make that clear as you're setting up your account, uh, that we say something like, only only answer the questions that you feel comfortable asking. But, why, sorry. but what's the point of, of having that information? Why do we need that? Why do we offer the, the choice of filling out these questions? Well, we, I, mean, I think this big spectrum of people that were in the room, if you like. On the one hand, you, let's say you have economic migrants way over there, if you want to call them that, people who are perfectly happy. In fact, they're actually looking for a job to this thing, you know, like as if they're on LinkedIn in a way. And on the other hand, you've got super vulnerable migrants, refugees. <coughs> Human rights victims, <coughs> and perhaps we need to really think really carefully about that and tell people if you're if this is a human rights issue, we recommend you know you don't share these details. And I think we just need to kind of drill down into that a little bit more. But what do we need the details for? Well, uh, uh, because we want to celebrate the champions out there who are doing great things for migrants and refugees to fight xenophobia, and they're all over the place. And that would be in the story. But it's also championing. Uh, is a contributor. This is, this is an example of a contributor rather than the story. This isn't a profile of a migrant. Oh, yeah. This is a contributor who's a volunteer for this campaign. And I mean, I was warned not to make this comparison, but I'm going to make it anyway. Um, one of the ideas we have behind it is that TripAdvisor has fewer employees than there are in this room today. But they have a shareholder value of four billion, which is true. And most of that comes from people volunteering their free effort and labor do a good thing, generally speaking. So we want to kind of somehow emulate that. So we yeah. want to empower people. But you don't give your private information on TripAdvisor. You don't even need to give your name. Uh, well, there's lots of social media profiles in which people do choose to and want to champion. Yeah. And they can do it uh, under a, a Mickey Mouse alibi or under their own, it's their own choice. And I think we could certainly have much clearer health warnings on human rights issues or other issues, vulnerability issues. But you really don't want to shut it down. You want to, I mean, part of the game is, why are we doing this? We're doing this because of the tidal wave of xenophobia against refugees and migrants in our, in our public space, in our media. And we want to fight that with positive stories that are from real people. And that requires a little bit of giving up your privacy if you're going to have something other than kind of a PR campaign from an international organization it requires a bit of authenticity. Mm -hmm. So we have to we have to kind of balance somewhere between those stuff. Um, and I think that just, just to follow up on a nice point that like what we found from the I'm a migrant campaign is that people like to see the distances that people have traveled, where they've come from and where they are and how global migration is. Um, so by having this information on someone's profile, that was the thinking behind we have <coughs> where they are where they where they come from and the sort of distance in between and then while we were sort of developing what the profile would look like we sort of thought about other um other massive uh, social media apps and what people are comfortable with putting out there um and if you look at some of the sort of like uh, millennial like app users they're a lot more comfortable with sharing content but obviously in this case it can be we don't want to create any harm, so we'll make sure that, like Leonard says, that we have the checks in place that nothing that shouldn't be shared would be shared at the same time. 
So we want to give people the freedom to be able to share things, but we'll also make sure that it's not harmful. Uh, sorry, I am sorry. I am support of the, the campaign in Spanish uh, the website. So always ask to the people I work in this campaign for show the positive way to the immigration. And many people say no, but some people say yes. I would like to participate because I would like to show my history. <coughs> After this guy from Mexico and and show the web page and then I send the, the, the question and he answered me. I'm very positive. And, he, and then he put the audio in the website. Maybe you don't have enough time, but if you want to understand Spanish, I start to listen to Spanish. And maybe one key thing that we haven't really highlighted enough is that we'd hope that this would be a tool for different sort of networks to use, um, like Amnesty, so different groups like that, where it's actually you have more sort of volunteers recording mm -hmm. stories. So they themselves wouldn't necessarily always be migrants and refugees. It's about really engaging with the host populations um, and showing their support of um, migrants and refugees. So you don't have you, sh you shouldn't always think of the user as a migrant and refugees. They're often from the host community, uh, and they'd be fine with showing uh, this this personal information, but they also don't necessarily have to show it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was thinking that maybe some of the concerns could be alleviated if you just put so much of an accent on that interview part because all your stories are formatted as interviews and it's very introspective so you're necessarily going to dig down on details about people whereas the action side is more about actions that host communities have put in place together with refugees and migrants so maybe there's just the presentation of the angle of that mm -hmm. I mean if, if that could be perhaps uh, just told in a different way because I know it's yeah. confusing to go but for, for me frankly my concern is not about the content it's mm -hmm. about the profile because the content is really what people choose to say about their story, or mm -hmm. but it's the profile that is trackable, that is you know um, comparable. Too many things can be done, and it's an open platform. Meaning, it's not like Facebook when you can restrict it. Here, anybody would have access to it. I think you need to think of these guys as like the streamers of the network. Like go on to look up Joel Milman, for example, on the internet. You see. Joel Milman used to be a correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. He's written these interesting stories. He did this, this, and this, and this. It's a profile of him. And that's, we see that this piece of it more about creating a community of people for action. People who will go and collect those stories. People who will talk about it and build, build their own NGO around this piece. Yeah. Rather than the vulnerable. And they are. I mean, for example, for us on Stand Up for Human Rights, we have the platform where people talk about how they stood up for the rights of others, right. but they do it through a hashtag. So we're not asking for identifying themselves. Some do, like Amnesty, for example, when they post, they they post on the uh, Stand Up campaign, they identify themselves, but that's really their choice. <laughs> Otherwise, they through the hashtag, and you know we don't know who they are. I mean, they write interesting stories. We reproduce those stories. We curate those stories, but we don't really know more, and we're not asking for more. Yeah, I was just, my concern is really how much this content is going to be seen. Um, as in, uh, sorry, I don't to catch your name. In it. The point you made about the app, I'm, I'm in full agreement with. Um, you know, I don't know what this is, just looking it up. Is it 90% of apps are never downloaded, and then 75% of apps are downloaded, used once, and deleted? And you know, uh, just the competition out there is staggering. People are spending an hour a day on Facebook on the app. How are we going to get them to go into this app? And then from the off, that really, my question is, how do you plan to promote it? Do you have 
media partnerships in mind? Is there any way the App Store will put it on its homepage? You know, it's, it's, it seems to me a mountain to climb just to tell the world that it's out there, let alone to get people to keep it on the phone and keep coming back into it. And, and then that's more of a technical question about what kind of notifications do you have in it? I mean, you know, the thing that makes Facebook addictive is constant notifications. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so, so how are you going to make it engaging? So on the notifications, we do want to have a push notification feature. Um, but we haven't quite come to what the notifications would be. We were thinking that if someone has someone new from your group has posted a story, that you get a notification about that story. Or from if you can follow the campaigns, that if a new story is posted under that campaign, then you get a notification, you can read the story. Or if someone has liked your story, you get a notification, like you get on Instagram if someone likes your picture. Um, when it comes to promoting the app, this is a big ask that we have to everyone who's a part of the Together campaign. So we've come to be able to put this together uh, and develop it, um, both an app and you can you can go on the web version if you don't want to download the app. Um, but to get people to download it, we'll be promoting it through our social media um, once it's final. Uh, the UN with DPI will be promoting it, but all of the different agencies need to be involved in that promotion, including the, <coughs> the partnership with the Together campaign with Wyden and Kennedy. Uh, we'd have to approach them and see how that they, maybe they could support also the promotion of the app. I'm just going to say, I think it's it's a really good point that Lisa makes. So, you know, most people, I got me, have like dozens of apps that you never look at. You can look at the same three, of course. That's clear. I think just try and separate out between the big public out there, which is probably not the immediate target of this, and ourselves, you know, and our community of, you know, PIs, writers, streamers, fellow travelers, what have you. The think of the scout movement with 50 million people worldwide, all with a kind of similar orientation to the UN. Think of the Girl Guide movement, think of the World Council of Churches, think of all of those groups where you have motivated people to really feel the effect of the Trump, the Brexit, the Le Pen, and are really concerned. I mean, we have to kind of remember this. We're not doing this because we're having fun. No. It is fun having you here today, but we're not motivated by that fact. We're motivated by the fact that there's a tidal wave of crap which is about to wipe us all off the map if we're not careful. And there are plenty of people outside our circle who are motivated. So, sure, you're absolutely right. This is not for the public, at least at this level. Hopefully it will be. But we have to work with the kind of many communities of interest, and there's so many of them. That we, and the idea here was to give them a direct motivation to go and get on the app and promote their particular take on refugees, migrants, human rights, these issues that come under together. Yeah. And potentially, I don't know if it's possible, potentially allow an NGO to even raise funds to it for itself directly. And that's why we set up the group function in the app, so that we could partner with these networks, these already existing networks, uh, to get them using it and self-promote within their groups. Well, um, you, you said fun on the line. They couldn't come today. That would be quite important. Really important. Yeah. The schools and stuff. Yeah. And potentially. But it's, it's obviously it's a very useful discussion today to tease out some of these, you know, really super important issues. Oh, I was just—I was thinking the the UN launched an app for the Sustainable Development Goals of Living Stories. I was wondering if you're interested. They don't know what their success with that is and what their feedback is on how they're. Doing. But there's a little bit of a of a similar idea, I think, at the beginning, so that theirs perhaps was targeted at the general public more than at the pillars of this community of sustainable development people. But I don't know if you've been touching in touch with them to know how they're doing. That. Maybe the same John could answer. Yeah. Them. It's the same surface. John, maybe do you have any info, more info on the SDGs app? I know we have looked at it as we've been developing this as well, but I don't know if DPI might have more. John, you still there? Maybe he's not there anymore, but we can definitely get him to maybe email this group sort of the what's worked well with it. Yeah, the impression I have is that it's not, it's not. Really on fire. I've tried to use it, and um, you know, I've, I mean, yours looks easier to use just like this. But I mean, we hope in a way that the stories here, by linking them to each individual story, to uh, 
sustainable development goal, you kind of have reached the thing which is incomprehensible to me, I would say. Mm -hmm. 17 goals, I defy anybody in the room to subside them. But by having a story linked to one or other, you kind of start to get your head around it and to understand a little bit, a piece of it. John, we just saw your video. Are you, can you hear us? We just saw your phone. <laughs> Okay, maybe not. <laughs> so, Joel, as you just described, it, this is more about rallying the base, or Leonard, sorry, about rallying the base more than reaching the kind of persuadable, anxious middle. Is that at least, at at least as an initial step? I think step. so. And it, it, success depends on people in this room deciding to success, to be not perfectly honest. At the end of the day, it depends on us creating a, a kind of a neutral space where we can co manage it. In a way that we all feel comfortable that our stuff isn't getting overshadowed or put down the list, that type of thing. And uh, it reflects the energy we put into it. Um, first of all, let me thank you very much for organizing this. I think it's very, very useful. Uh, and it's uh, laudable that IOM took the initiative to try and develop something because we certainly do need, as you said, something to counter the xenophobic wave. Of, I would say, communication around xenophobia and right wing ideology. Um, and I, I, I think it's an eye opener for me uh, to listen to all the comments around here. I mean, Gisela is our expert and has quoted this statistic that one, every, one of every four mobile users drop an app after one use. Um, so that's 75% of all users. There are 4 billion people, at least with mobile phones and, and um, devices in the world. But I keep, I keep asking myself, why? And I'm not sure what the why is. The why, of course, we need a platform to put something together that will counter the very clever right-wing ideological campaign that's out there and that is gripping the world today and voters, and changing governments. And, um, we all have our own websites, which consume a lot of our time, energy, resources. We write stories, you write stories. UNICEF writes stories, uh, human rights writes stories. Our stories are there on our websites. And if it were a simple thing of cutting and pasting a story, but this is a bit, there are steps you have to follow, and, um, then it would be less labor intensive. I have the feeling it's adding another layer to our work. And you know, I'm being never advocate here. Uh, I really do admire the fact that you've come up with this idea, and I'd like us to be part of something together because it, the, the, the world needs it today. So, does it add another la layer to your work, each and every one of us here, that we're going to have to tell the story again? In a different, on a different platform. Um, and you explain briefly how you're going to push people to the app, but I mean, how I'd like to hear a little more about how you're going to get people, because really today it's about going to the people, not asking them to come to you. Uh, and um, I get the, I understand that it's now the people telling the stories here can be any individual or an organization. So, so it could be UNICEF going on here and posting the story of Leonard Doyle who, who, who fled uh, Dublin um, for greener pastures in, uh, in, uh, in Haiti and then uh, realized his mistake and moved to Geneva. Uh, I mean, that could be a set story. So it's individuals and, and agencies. Well, the and stories would be individuals. Yeah, the so, stories of individuals. Yeah. Posted by individuals or agencies, no, at or the, agencies. At the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts. Yeah. Well, no, at the moment it's only posted by individuals, um, and then you tag it under a campaign of an agency or you belong to a group of an organisation. So at the moment we only have individual accounts, but we can look at having um, organisational pages or accounts. But we we're hoping that the group function sort of fulfilled that need. Uh, I'd be interested, you know, DPI has to, since it's an umbrella, okay. and, you know, we've, we've been mandated by member states at the Global Summit to do something called the Together Campaign. Uh, and, and 
you came up with this idea, which is, on the face of it, seems simple and brilliant and safe, safe, uh, straightforward. But I think DPI has to uh, play a greater role in in creating this umbrella. Maybe it's a site that points everyone to each individual site, and that's it. You know, you want more on migrants, go to Iowa. You want more on refugees, you want more on children, go. And here's the link. I mean, that's, that remains. Nobody's for a second saying that, saying that yeah. the agency should stop doing their own advocacy. That's, why would that change? Uh, you know, and, and what, what I think this could do is that it seems to me that the cost of agencies producing the content is quite, can be quite high if you have you know, the, the steps between the P4 to the P2 to the consultant to the collector of the story. It can end up being quite an expensive process. Whereas if you are getting stuff over the transom created by individuals that you are simply curating, you might be able to change the economics of the way we work as well. Because uh, I think our cherry picking and creating stories is often, you know, we're kind of doing it, we're, we're, doing, we're kind of over messaging it in a way. Interesting to hear what people themselves have to say. And to go back to a point like this is a campaign as it is now, it just seems to me to be. Pardon of anybody listening in New York, it seems to be a bit of a dog's dinner or a dog's breakfast by its very nature because, you know, we are what we are and giving it things that we've already prepared for kind of another reason. And in terms of the stories, they can be cut and paste, of course. And that's kind of the point, get them, get them up, get them cut and paste and get them out on social media in a way that's a little bit <coughs> more coherent. <coughs> I'm not sure if you can hear us in New York, we're trying again. We can hear you now. Yeah. You now. Uh, awesome. Sorry about that. We're having some audio issues. Um, I, I, there's a couple of points that were raised, and um, we were having a conversation here, but with the microphone. Um, one around the challenges of apps, and I think uh, we're fully aware of how hard it is to popularize something like this. Um, and I think the the question is, is, is who is the audience? Whether they we're really trying to get this into the mindset of the general public, or is this a fairly niche app to begin with that works for certain uh, parts of civil society and academia who ha have been asking, you know, how to get involved with together, what to do. So, and also it might work behind the scenes in terms of uh, tagging content. Um, so like deciding the broader audience, I think is a question that needs to be figured out. I don't know, we weren't involved in the, uh, the app that we refer to, but it's a fair point, and we should definitely find out how successful that's been. I don't know of any UN apps that have been successful. Like, I highly doubt there is anything that even you know challenges uh, the, the major apps. But let's at least find out. Um, and then I think on like the fact that together campaign is in theory an umbrella, which does lead it to being quite messy. Um, I, what what we're experiencing um, is just this kind of lag between the the concept coming out of the summit. Um, and then the various partners come together, but a a actually, you know, there's, there's so many ideas, like small ideas, but it does need to be pulled together. And I think we, we definitely share that feeling here. Um, and the website, I think is just the perfect reflection for where the campaign is at, which is, it feels quite thin. Um, and there isn't a kind of regularized content production. Uh, and that's the kind of next stage, which we're super keen to get to, which is, you know, we want to be coming every few days uh, that serves a purpose. And, you know, you know, the fact that we're down to talking, making stories about the Together logo, once you start talking about your logo, you're in trouble. Um, so I, I, I do think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But the idea of generating these personal stories is really where the agency was very interested in taking it and where we're really interested in taking it. So I, I, I think that's the next phase. And, we were told really the, the the summer period is where we're expecting the next major push. I wish Stefania was here to add to it, but uh, that's uh, you know what we know so far. And there's some really valid points been raised in the room, so thank you. We're going to have to wrap it up, I'm afraid, at this point. But just to quickly answer to that point, I think one of the audiences has got to be the media, such as it is. And the media is everybody from a blogger to somebody just thrown hey, I want 500 words in half an hour with a color sidebar on a migrant who's just arrived in the city from somewhere in Africa. So that journalist throwing that assignment could ideally go onto this site and find a migrant refugee with a <coughs> story, with a validated background from a UN agency that they can take right away with a quote. 
So the, the notion being that we can populate the media landscape <coughs> with valid stories that are not kind of made up stories that you know they're not all about migrants you know knocking people over the head is what we see in our local media a lot of the time. <coughs> And also that these stories are fascinating in their own right and become the feedstock of the advertising industry, of the movie industry, of all of those industries, the songwriters of the world. They get inspired by these great stories which have come from real people, kind of unmediated, except for privacy, protection, all of those really important pieces. That we actually become <coughs> not the creators of the media, but the creators of the content the media go on and use. I mean, that's the hope at least. But I'm going to have to call it a day because people have buses to catch and planes to go on. And I want to thank you all for this really rare visit. We don't really have people here at I was great. <laughs> at least in the media department. Welcome to the UN family. So thank you so much for coming and for joining us. Meetings, in. meetings, meetings. It's been really great. Well, where do we go from here? I mean, what's the next step? The next step. Do we want us to continue? That's the first question. Does the room want I want to continue? Is, is this a vote we have to take now? Or shall we go, <laughs> well, if you go know, home and digest? We have just had a couple red of lights. Uh, we got picked up some amber lights, of course. Yeah. Um, what we're doing is we're developing this app kind of, you know, with our pocket money <coughs> through an association we have with Sheffield Talent University, <coughs> which works on a cost recovery basis. So there's no kind of profit motive in here. In terms of where we go, like as it grows at some point, if we find value in it, we obviously look for support to make it work. Whether it's donor support or agency support, if it has value, if it's worthwhile. Have you heard back from the SRSG about this app in particular or about the Together campaign? No. Uh, we just hear kind of positive noises, very positive noises from Stefania, who I assume is reflecting the noises received from Louise. Yeah. It is very positive from the SRSG's office. Every time we've talked to her, um, she's very keen to get it into all the talking points and to promote the campaign. Uh, but the, the run, you know, there needs to be like a timeline of events and um, some you know, specific actions that need to happen with the SRSG, but it is early days. I mean, I think for us as an outcome of this group today, it would be great if we could have a focal point from every side who can you know, be the person who says, my agency doesn't really like this piece, or could you change it that way? So at least, without committing to being part of it, we, at least we're, we're developing it in the direction that reflects the needs of the room. And from, from our perspective, I mean, we, we have International Day for Disaster Reduction in October, and we've already been thinking of looking at this project before we came, came here, um, how we could get and use it to tell stories of people who've been affected by disasters, notably people who've been displaced, you know, which are our two areas cross over. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a very common interest to certainly in this area. So, so I think this would, yeah. I mean, perhaps I can't speak from the entire organization, yeah, but I think from the communications unit perspective, it's something that we would like to do. Well, perhaps we so is that a, an I vote? Yeah, I think it's a green one. <laughs> Um, we have a focal point. Gisela Lomax will be the focal point for UNHCR. Fantastic. Excellent. And why don't we just proceed with focal points, and then, as others need to be brought in. And we need to digest all of this, and maybe give us 48 hours or something. Oh, no, more than that. Yeah. 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 No, we need to move, right? It's <coughs> September. Yes, but here will be taking leave, etc. Yes. But, but I really think that um, Ahmed made a point that was very important, which is we, <coughs> we wanted to hear from uh, John and Andrea what is going to be DPI's role? Because it's going to be, I mean, this app is wonderful, but the campaign itself is still run by DPI. Right, John? For Dominica, you, you have to come up with answers. DPI, you you represent DPI in this room. But of course, we have DPI in New York over there. Yeah. I think the resource is John, yeah. did you hear the question? If you want us to comment, sorry. Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, as you know, there's a small team here. There's uh, Andrea, Michael, um, working with Stefania's consultants. I, I do a little bit part time on the campaign. Um, so there are people behind the campaign, but the idea is to enable all the partners uh, to run with it. Um, I think there has been a bit of a pause waiting for the SRSG to sign up and join. And now clearly the SG and the SRSG are fully behind the campaign. They, they both offered their support. So it's given it the, the kind of green light to continue. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I think if Stefania was here, she'd probably talk you through all the upcoming moments uh, that they've got planned and the partnership with Widen and Kennedy. Yeah, there's a lot of different things going on. 
um, and how this app fits into that overall picture. I mean, as I said, I think the app primarily at the moment is looking at the storytelling part of it, which is the main feature of the widening Kennedy uh, proposition for the Together campaign, which is all about personal stories and positive stories. Um, so that's where I see it fitting in. But uh, um, if you do want some more details, then I think the next partnership call is this week for the Together campaign. And I think all the people in the room, or at least most of you, uh, are invited. And it's a good opportunity that meeting to go over everything with Stefania the, that is planned. So I hope that helps for now. But DPI is definitely uh, involved in the Together campaign and will continue to try and lead it. But your feedback is is totally vital. So if you've got concerns and comments, then just keep sending it because it, it's really useful to have it. Thank you. Final question, is there a name for the app? It's called Together. It would be called the, the Together app. It needs to be. And then we put the Together yeah, I think it needs to be. It needs to be a neutral space, if you like. No. <laughs> um, so as I said, um, it'd be great if we had a focal point from each agency. And then I've already emailed out the link to the to the app. Um, they're sort of just like um, reactive PDFs, so you can look at it on your phone as if it is an app and click some of the functionalities to be brought to you to different spaces. So we'd love for you to have a look at it on your phone um, and based off sort of our conversations today and send us any more feedback. We've taken notes of the things that you said um, so that we can continue to work on how we can develop it for it to be better. Uh, but whoever the focal point is, please send us uh, more feedback by the end of the week, maybe it would be great. But we'll we'll send another email after this with the link as well, just in case people haven't seen it. Thank you, Olivia, for leading leading the show today. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.